standard time. But today we're going from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. because I have a lot of value to give. Um, as you guys have already seen, the title of this live stream is going to be all based around sales conversion hacks. And so you're going to want to make sure you have a pen and paper handy. Uh, sit tight. Thank you very much for your patience. I appreciate you guys joining in as we wait for everyone else to join us. Enjoy the intermission. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Sales Remastered. I'm your host, Daniel Neekart, and today we have another episode of the live stream Breakfast of Champions. Again, this happens every Thursday from usually 8.30 a.m. to 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Today, we made an exception because I've got so much value to give. And as I'd mentioned, the, the uh, title for this live stream is gonna be Sales Conversion Hacks. And so these hacks are small adjustments that you can make to your current sales process that's going to increase your conversion. And you know what that means, right? So when you increase your conversion, you're obviously gonna get more results back. You're gonna get more in return. And I think that's the key thing is that you need to maximize the opportunity that you have before you as a salesman. You know, whether however you look at your job, you know, at the end of the day, you have an opportunity to make more income than most people you know, as long as you know how to do your cycle, your your process efficiently. And I think that's the key word for this live stream. Um, it's going to be learning how to hack your own mindset and hack your attitude, hack your drive. It's all these little small adjustments. And you'll see that as we go through this live stream, these little recommendations may kind of seem cliche, may some of them maybe seem obvious, but I promise you, it's so, so powerful when you know how to implement it and you know how it actually changes the, um, the results, in, in essence, that you give per day. And so before I begin, I just want to get, remind you guys, you know, if you haven't already, 
downloaded a copy of the sales script, I'll be sure to leave a comment below. Quick shout out to everyone who's already enrolled into the sales boost camp. The program is doing so amazing. I mean, the just seeing the reviews, seeing the feedback, um, getting an opportunity to do these video testimonials of, of other loan officers across the country that I'm working with. I truly am blessed and I'm fortunate enough to be part of their growth and part of your growth. If you're if you're already enrolled into the course or if you've done, if you've uh, invested in yourself and you've consumed any of the uh, courses that I have for sale at salesremaster.com, I, I, I appreciate your support for the channel. But more importantly, I applaud you for taking the time to invest in yourself. And if money's tight, hey, I get it, and that's why I do these live streams that's why I you know do the uh, the content sharing on social media is so that I can help you get your paper right I can help you get your money right so not only are you able to invest in yourself but again you'll have more fun doing the job that you do every single day so without further ado let's talk about today's topic you know the reason why today's topic even came to mind was I'm right now I'm currently studying the differences in actions that you know, top performers make versus the mediocre, right? As well as uh, actions that Titans make. Like Titans is the next level, in my opinion. I believe you know you get to a to a, a high producing status, and then and then what, right? Like where do you go after that? And I think the next step after that is to become a creator, like to become a provider, um, more like a Titan. Like you are you are changing the way that business is done, and you're just simply adapting to current modern time. And that's what we're going to do today. A lot of the lessons that I'm going to share with you has bits and pieces of, of wordplay, sales copy that influences the mind. It influences the, the recipient of the message. And a lot of it has to do with, uh, with emotional intelligence and just kind of understanding what influences people. I, I've always been so kind of infatuated with, with that science of, of you know, NLP, which is Neuro Linguistic Programming, um, to persuasion, to marketing, and seeing how things work. And in the process of studying these, these uh, little hacks or these little actions, I've discovered the difference between what top performers do versus the mediocre. So if you're mediocre right now, don't even sweat it. It's not, most of the time, it's not even your fault. I find that oftentimes that salespeople just don't have the right resources. They don't have the right support. And that's why I'm so happy to provide uh, content like this that's available for free. But more importantly, I appreciate you for, for actually investing some time in yourself. And that's the reason why you're here. So without further ado, let's go and get into the content. So First off, sales conversion hacks, the idea is to give you a better position so that you can convert that engagement or convert that, that contact of a lead. Because every day we, we look for leads, right? But the key thing is, though, you can have the best marketing in the world. You can have the best resource, the best referral partner. But if you don't know how to actually influence the end consumer, which is the lead, you're going to have a difficult time of reaching that next level and optimizing your sales process. And so these lessons, and I'm going to share a few of the, these little changes that you could do and you can implement in today that will completely change your result. And I'm looking forward to your feedback. So before we dive in, let me uh, ask you, everyone, if, you, if you're watching right now comment in the comment section the engagement really helps grow this channel i i completely applaud you i support you i know how embarrassing it might be to type a couple <laughs> keys on your keyboard and oh no they're gonna see me comment but i appreciate you for having the courage to comment the state you're from uh comment throughout the actual live stream and you know give me your feedback man i, I really thrive off that and for me giving you value give me some value in return by helping me grow this channel and all i'm asking you is for to engage hit that like button you know share it with your team but more importantly make sure the engagement is strong okay so again comment in the comment box let me know what state you're tuning in from uh, whether you're catching this on Facebook YouTube Instagram or, or even uh, Twitter I appreciate your your attention so let's start off with uh, with one lesson or at least one hack that I know top performers have really mastered and 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 the the irony is that a lot of top performers don't even realize that they do it and it, it's a concept that i actually learned from napoleon hill uh, after the fact that I was already practicing it for quite some time and this practice is called auto suggestion auto suggestion is is basically how you you know you might think of it as like positive affirmations or positive self talk uh, but auto suggestion is really understanding to me, in my opinion, is really understanding your initial instinct. 
meaning how do you react to certain things, right? And so auto-suggestion, there, there's, there's an internal dialogue. There's an internal dialogue and an external dialogue. External dialogue is basically your environment. It's your surroundings. It's your friends. It's your family. It's maybe your sales team. And you're heavily influenced by the external dialogue, right? Like that's why they, they, it's so important to understand who you surround yourself with because typically of the five people that you're, you're most closest with, you're the average of that five. And so, you know, there's science behind it, but at the end of the day, in me, in my opinion, in bare bones, what I believe is that your environment influences you and then it influences your internal dialogue. But there are certain hacks that you could, you could take regardless if your environment may be a little negative or your environment may be... Maybe Maybe not providing the right resources to you or the guidance or the mentoring. And so besides the external dialogue, because that you control, you can control that by consuming content at Sales Remastered. You can control your environment by simply changing who you surround yourself by or with. And if you're trying to get to the next level, or if you're trying to get to management, or you're trying to get to that six figure income, or you want to make 40 grand a month, all you need to do is surround people who are currently doing that. Surround yourself with people who are currently doing that. And you don't necessarily need to do it physically. You could do it, you could do it virtually too as well from content on YouTube or Facebook or you know audiobooks. You just have to be able to change what influences you externally. But what we're gonna talk about in this hack is your actual internal dialogue. And so what I'm talking about is like, um, you know, we'll use goals for example. When you set up a goal, usually what I've noticed the difference between the two from mediocre to top producers is that they'll use a word uh, want. Like, like when they set up the appointment, they say, hey, Daniel, I want to hit 20 loans or I want to make 15 grand. I want to uh, make more money than I did last year. The, the key word is want. And so your auto suggestion or your instinct is to say you want. The idea and the little switch, the little change is changing that word from want to need. It's as simple as that. And so I've noticed that when I, when I engage with top producers and I ask them, you know, what, is, what are your goals? What they end up saying is I need, and then watch, try it out. Like if you go to someone who you know is confident and really killing in the game, ask them, say, hey, what are you gonna do this year? They're gonna say, I need. And there's a, there's a difference between the two because when you think about anchoring, like anchoring is an NLP uh, strategy. It's, it, it's the way we are triggered by a specific word. So if you say, I want to use the bathroom versus I need to use the bathroom, that's two different dialects, right? It's two different dialogues. Like I want to use the bathroom could mean that uh, you probably get by if you didn't. Does that make sense? You could probably hold it for a little bit longer. But if you say, I need to use the bathroom, then you're already fixated on achieving that objective. And so try that because if your initial instinct is to say, I want to win, I want to fund 10 loans or 15 loans or 15 loans, whatever it is, like just switch it up and learn how to change that word to need. Um, another thing is, is, uh, is will and if. Like um, I, I uh, let's say, instead of saying like, uh, well, if I hit 10 units or if I hit 15 goals, or I'm sorry, 15 loans, then I'll hit X amount of dollars. You have to change that, that, that di again, that switch that word from if to will, right? Like, so if I make it, versus I will make it. And so again, the, 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 the sudden switch of the two words is so powerful because it immediately anchors an emotional trigger to within you. And so again, the difference between need and want is, are two different things, but they ultimately technically mean the same. They sound the same, right? But when it comes from you, your auto suggestion puts it out in the universe. It's very, very powerful. So promise, uh, just write that down. Like the next time you hear you say, I want, but it's something that you really, really, really want, change it to need. So if you say, I want to make $360,000 this year, change it to need and you'll naturally respond and react accordingly. Um, another switch up is like uh, offering, uh, I'm sorry, um, high to hey. Like, so if you think about, the way that that your external dialogue when you're reaching out to prospects or even trying to get attention from let's say your manager or your sales team i want you to try switching up like when you're the traditional email when you're soliciting business is hi daniel right and then you type out the body well i want you to switch it up and actually put hey so instead of hi put hey because hey is is different than just saying hi if you think about most solicitors or telemarketers, what they end up starting by to say is hi. 
hi, Daniel, my name is Daniel, right? Like, and it, it, ultimately what that is, is it's an intrusion of privacy. It's an intrusion of time. And we have wired ourselves to react a certain way to hi versus hey. I promise you, it's powerful. It's, 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 it's amazing how small of a, of, a, of, a, of a tweak that is, but how much more uh, compliance and much more attention you actually grab by simply changing that. And if you're one who's typing up emails right now, soliciting, you don't even put hi, hey, you just put like Daniel, <laughs> right? You have to think about your, 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 uh, your strategy. The idea is that you want to capture attention and you also want to be as professional as possible because you want people to like you, right? And you can't do it if you're being too business-like. Like you don't even have, you know, the quick second to type in three letters or even two, like hi Daniel versus Daniel, right? It's little things like that 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 the consumer uses to to judge you and judge whether or not they want to engage you. So the next time that you reach out to somebody on an email, you know, try hey. Hey, Daniel, and then they'll read more of the message versus, hi, Daniel, my name is Daniel with New American Funding or whatever the, the, the technique that you're using. So again, switch hi to hey. Um, another one is, is when you go into an engagement with a prospect, oftentimes what we're finding ourselves doing is leaving voice messages, right? And a simple hack or a simple t uh, tweak that you can do um, that will more than likely res get you more response, like people will reply back to you. Because the last thing you want to do is try to pitch a deal on an email or pitch a deal through text, right? So you have to create that curiosity to make the actual contact on the phone where you're communicating with them in person, you're communicating with them on the phone. And what I've learned is that Number one is not too many people are actually answering their phones anymore. Because if you think about it, when you get a call from a phone number who you don't recognize, you're either going to answer it uh, expecting that it's a, it's a business solicitation. You're going to answer it thinking it's a, maybe a robocall. Um, or you're going to answer it or not even answer. You're just going to push it straight to voicemail. But the, but the thing is, though, is that the likelihood of you listening to the voicemail is going to be based on whether or not the the phone number is even recognizable right and so oftentimes voicemails don't even get don't even get listened to but again we'll leave a lot of voice messages and hope that they that they respond back so the the small hack that you could do is every voice message you leave or every phone call you make make sure it's followed up with a text message and an email and the idea is that they should all fuse together so your voice message may sound something like, hey, Daniel, I just sent over an email to your iCloud account, and I'm also going to send you over text. Sorry I missed you. Reply back when you get it. Very simple, right? Um, whereas most salespeople will go into it and say, hey, this is Daniel. Um, I just wanted to follow up on the numbers. Again, here are your options, option number one, option number two. And there's just so much data um, that we're asking that, that, that consumer to take time out of their busy day to read. And without empathy, you're not going to realize that they're just going to get frustrated. They're, the easiest thing that they could do is say, I'm not interested, because then that, that excuses them from having to use the mental capacity and actually consuming that message. And I think it's just honestly a waste of time. So you want to go through the details when you're actually connected with them, where you can gauge their tonality and you can actually communicate with them. Does that make sense, guys? So, so when you leave a message, um, again, it will sound something like that, but it's all focusing back on the two other forms of contact. Same thing with the text. The text says, uh, hey, Daniel, just left a voice message and sent an email. Please reply back to confirm receipt. That's, th that's it, the text. It's not saying, hey, Daniel, um, can we schedule an appointment at 5 p.m.? Because the easiest thing, again, for them to do is say no. So you want to leave curiosity so they all resort back to, back to themselves. But what we're finding is that consumers are more likely to respond by text versus email and then by email versus voicemail or versus a phone call, right? And so if we just understand these things, then we can kind of position ourselves a little bit more favorably to get, act get actually in connection with that person that we need to convert into a sale. So if you're giving calls right now and you're just leaving voice messages wondering why they're not calling you back, it's because you're not doubling up. So you're not tripling up actually because you're not sending them also an email and then also a text message. And it's it's important that you make that switch because if you're if you're doing a lot of actions, you're you don't want to mistake movement with achievement, right? Um, you you don't want to mistake that you left a lot of voice messages, but at a, at the end of the day, those voice messages aren't going to be heard because it wasn't done correctly, right? So I didn't build up enough curiosity um, to even make that message stand out. 
But if I send a text message and an email kind of eluding and pointing to that, I just left you a message, then I'll have more of a chance for that person to give a call back or check the voice message or check the text. And then what happens when they check it is that they're going to see it all just fused back to connecting with me. Right. And so the email would sound something like, hey, Daniel, I just left you a voice message, shot you over a text as well. I got some information I need to release to you, but I need to confirm that this email is valid. Or I need to confirm that that um, I could send it by email. Would you like me to give you a call? And so again, it's building curiosity and it's giving them two outs, right? So it's giving them, uh, instead of saying, hey, give me a call, I'm actually letting the person decide what they feel most comfortable with. And oftentimes they feel most comfortable with just replying by email. Again, because our consumers have so many things distracting them, it's a matter of getting yourself in the best possible position to do what it is you need to do to win. And that's one of them is, is just understanding how you're, how you're making initial contact, switch hi to hey. Like, so if you're, li- if you're leaving a voice message, I don't say, hi, Daniel, <laughs> right? Because I sound like a telemarketer right off the bat. Instead, I say, hey, Daniel, um, I just sent you over a quick message. I sent you over a quick email. Just that small change makes the message sound as if it's meant to happen, as if we know each other, as if, uh, as if hey, I need your attention. Look at this, right? And so you'll, you'll naturally tune in. And I want you to pay attention to how you react to when you're going through the outdoor malls or when you receive a, a solicitation call and that person says hi, notice how you immediately react. Like, what? What is this? I don't want your free conditioner. I don't want your free advertising, whatever it is. But if they said, hey, then you're naturally inclined to pay a little bit more attention. That makes sense. So comment below. Let me know if that makes sense to you guys. That shit's powerful, bro. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you definitely got to try it. Um, but finally, when you do get in contact with your prospect, right, the, the real hack is to change your approach versus like, because right now I think the, the stereotypical approach from salesmen is offering right? Like, so they're, you're calling your prospects, you're, you're, you're connecting with leads, even if it's an inbound and what your natural instinct is, is to offer. And that's fine because we're kind of trained that way, right? Like we got to offer solutions. We have to offer, um, free proposals. We need to offer a free assessment, whatever it is. But when you get into, into the, into the phase of, of actually giving, Meaning you change your approach from offering to, hey, I'm going to give it to you. Whether you like it or not, this is coming, right? Like you're going to notice that the, the energy and the dialogue of the, of the actual conversation is, is powerful enough in a way where they just accept it. People love free shit. People love free shit. And so when you say you're giving it to them, you know, like, hey, I, this is coming. I'm, I'm, I'm giving you the solution rather than offering. You're not leaving it up to your prospect to make the decision because the decision is what they fear. They don't want to make a decision because they fear the consequence of making the incorrect decision. And so pay attention to the way that you're driving your solutions or giving your presentation. Is it from a place of offering? Are you, are you actually asking your prospect to make a decision or are you giving it to them, assuming your prospect understands that now that is the solution and this is how to get it? Does that make sense? So now you've just given yourself authority subconsciously because of the way you're giving your communication. And so if you think about like if you've the last time you've ever been to a doctor, a doctor's not offering you a solution. The doctor is the is the subject matter expert. And so they're telling you exactly what you need to do or just the tax season. Right. Like for those of you who did taxes, you know that your accountant is not offering you like the ways to go. They're telling you like, hey, you need to do this. You need to do that. Uh, And if your accountant isn't doing that, then you need to invest in a better accountant, boo boo. But you need kind of that consultation. You need that expert advice, right? So switch up the way that you're giving your communication. And instead of offering, figure out how you can, you can change the approach into what you're just giving. Like I'm giving you the solution. I'm giving you the answers. Yeah, I'll give that over to you right now. It's actually on its way. But first, let me make sure Right. So it's always it's always in in motion. And I think that when our consumers hear that it's in motion or hear that, you know, it's already being done or it's meant to be done, they'll be a little bit less resistant and they'll kind of just go along with the flow because it doesn't require too much mental capacity. It doesn't require too much decision making. They're kind of just like, all right, well, let's see what's behind door number two. Does that make sense, guys? So besides that, though, um, I also want to talk about not returning or answering calls. I, for one, completely understand how busy we can get in the day. 
I get it. And there are times where we're in the midst of maybe doing three things, right? So we're replying back to an email. I'm in the middle of, of pricing and structuring a deal. And then now I got, uh, you know, an alert from an appraisal management company saying my value's low. And so I got all these different things, you know, pulling out from my attention. And then what ends up happening is I, I actually sleep on the most important things. So maybe someone's calling me, but I feel like I have three different things going on right now. So I can't answer the phone. Or, you know what, this is more important, so I'm not going to make the appointment. And making the appointment and answering the phone call is, is your reputation. It's, you know, they, there's a saying that says that the one way you do, the, the way you do one thing is how you do everything, right? And so if you prioritize your day versus saying, like, picking up the phone and just saying, hey, you know, I'm still in a meeting. I know we had a meeting at 3.30. Uh, is there any way we can move it to 4.30? Just doing that makes you accountable and it and and oddly enough our prospects will be more than they they will understand but the irony is though is that you give the prospect this impression that you're busy right like i don't want to work with someone who just has no one to help because at the, what you want is you want to work with someone who is a professional who knows what they're doing and so anyone who knows what they're doing typically is is busy right because they're they're doing what they know how to do and so when we tell our prospects that like you know instead of dodging their calls or not making the appointment and trying to come up with a reason later we've actually kind of tainted our credit and so now we're not reliable now we're not accountable we can't be you know get we can't we can't be in, in touch with or we don't answer our phone calls, it sets up a bad impression. And that impression typically happens usually at the beginning where they have to make a decision to even hire you. Because at the end of the day, as salesmen, we are in a position where we're asking them to hire us technically, right? So they have a ton of loan officers that they could hire or a ton of salesmen that they could hire, connect them with that service or product. And it's up to you on how you actually, whether or not you get that job, which is another thing. Here's a side note is that when because we are in a position where we feel like we need to be hired uh, by the consumer to do that job like if you want to hire me the you know the lender fee is this much or the, our rate is this much our cost is this much in essence our prospects turn into employers right they're basically the employer like hey if you don't hire me for this job i'm not going to make any money on this deal and i think that we may take that so seriously that we change ourselves we change our dynamic as if we're actually inside of a job interview and after doing hundreds to thousands of job interviews in my lifetime on both ends of the table from the hiring manager to the applicant right what i what i understand is that is that when you sit up straight and you and you're, you're on your best behavior, you know what I mean? It 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 comes off inauthentic, and it also gives the impression to the other person that they are the one who has the authority. But when you go into a powerful uh, uh, meeting, right, like a like an actual interview, the candidate who has the stronger chance to win the job is the confident one. It's the one that that is is actually collaborating within that actual meeting it's not the one that you know just stays quiet you know is only spoken speaks when they only sp when they're only spoken to there's no actual suggestion there's no driving force and so what i want us to do is pay attention to how we actually engage with our prospects are we engaging with them as kind of as as if they're the employer and they have determination of whether or not i'm going to get the job or are we engaging with them in, in in a way where we're convincing them that we are the best candidate for the specific job that they need right and so there's there's a complete difference but if you can understand that concept i think you'll get much more powerful results so besides that um another hack is actually pitching at random times so in my opinion i think sales in essence is kind of like poker it's kind of like you know texas hold'em where you never at, at one point want to show your full cards you always need to kind of play like you have the strongest hand in essence right and what i mean by that is you don't want to give too much away and so th that's why in poker there's there's uh, tails right like they, they'll have a poker face that whole terminology poker face is basically is basically whether your price is higher or whether your price is lower whatever your price is or whatever your pitch is you have to be selective with when you release that information because the second that you release information about interest rates payments or your costs then 
that is when you show your full cards, right? That's when you lay it all out on the table. And when that time comes, because it's gonna come every single time you do a pitch, you need to make sure that you're doing it at the absolute best time possible. What I'm finding out, or what at least what I'm seeing, that is one of the most inefficient ways to originate sales is that you just, you pitch whenever you're ready right? You're not pitching when the prospect is actually ready. And the prospect, again, is not going to be ready if they're at work. They're not going to be ready in 30 minutes because their spouse isn't ready or they're not at home or they're not in a position where they can give you their full undivided attention. And I think it's very, very important that you avoid pitching at random times. And so if you talk to um, John and it, you know, you got an opening in your day, you can't, you can't base it off that. You have to position yourself most favorably to it earned that business from John. And so a few things that I'm gonna pay attention to is, is, is John at work, right? Is John, uh, what does John do for work? Is he in the field, right? Cause there's gonna be a lot of distractions. Is he in the office? There's gonna be a lot of distractions. When does John usually go home? And is John married? Did John say we pay X amount of dollars? Or did John say we want to be qualified for X amount of dollars? Because if I pick that up, then I'm going to know that I'm not going to show my cards or, or actually talk about the meat and bones of my service until John is with that other person or John is out, you know, not in the field at work, working on an electric line or whatever it is that's just, that's causing distraction. I'm going to methodically plan it out in a way where I catch John either in commute home or at home. And it's all through the wordplay from the conversation, as opposed to saying, Hey John, it's going to take me 30 minutes. Let me give you a call back in 30 minutes because what will end up happening is I'm going to end up pitching John. John's going to be in a position where he knows he can't make the decision by himself. And it's instinctual to 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 say hey I gotta tell my wife about this because I can't you know make this decision on my own or okay let me go ahead and 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 digest this information because you pitch me at a time where I'm just getting distracted and I got alerts and I have no idea what what you're saying about LTV DTI or or FHA VA and you said a lot of confusing words so I just don't want to make a decision let me go ahead and get out of this distracting area so that I can really put some thought to it but the problem is that is that when John gets out of that distraction or gets out of that workplace, um, he's going to kind of forget about everything and then it's lost its gist, it's lost its mojo, right? There's no actual emotional buy-in because so many things have already taken his attention away where he's not at a peak of desire. He's not at a peak of, oh man, this is great stuff, you know? Uh, there are times though, there are times where you, you have to make an exception, right? Because maybe our, our, our schedule doesn't permit, but Understand that when you go into a sales pitch, that's your time to dance. That's your time to be on your game because you worked up a lot of time just to even bring it there. Whether it was a 30 minute phone call, four follow up calls, you know, there's a lot of, of, of steps and actions that go into place before you actually bring them to that pitch call or that pit, that presentation, whether you're doing it in person or you're doing it over the phone. So position yourself properly by not doing it at random times. You want to position yourself properly by doing it at the absolute best time that's most appropriate for the prospect to ensure that you have their attention, you have their engagement, and you have the ability to put them in front of a tablet or put them in front of a computer. So if we find out that they're more visual, like they, they keep saying like, yeah, I just want to go, I, I want to see what you're talking, you know, talking about. I want to see what this looks like. Show me, right? The, they're more visual. So, so if they're at a computer and without less distraction, I can email them real quick, like maybe a, a quick snap of, of what the payment to payment would be. And, but now I have, I have engagement, right? Where I think that a lot of us kind of will kind of go into a sales pitch and we'll just kind of blurt it all out. Like, Hey, here's our price. Here's a blah, blah, blah. And, and then we get confused when they say, Oh, I need to think about it. Or, Oh, I need to go home and tell my wife about this first. Let me see what she thinks. And I think that if we just made that little switch, we'll not only be more effective with our time, but we're going to free up our time because the last thing you want to do is pitch John and then pitch John and Sally again later on that day, go through the Q&A, right? And then still not even get an answer. You just spent damn near three hours on John and Sally when it could have easily been done in about 30 to 45 minutes, which frees up more time to get you more sales. When you implement these practices, you're going to convert more of them as well. Making sense, guys? Comment in the comment box. Let me know if this is making sense to you. Let me know if these little hacks you believe will help you level up your game or get a couple of more sales this week, if not today. And another hack that I wanted to talk about, and I have it written down here, 
is um, uh, doing processing and admin work. Man, and I know what you're probably thinking right now. You're like, yo, D, man, I got no choice, bro. I have to process my loans, man. My processor's not giving me a call back. They're, they're, they're not touching my file, right? And this is my money, D. I have to. I just, I have to do their job for them because who else is going to do it? And in my opinion, I think that I get it, but at the same time, you need to expose the inefficient operations that are at your organization. And in order to do such, you need to demonstrate that they're not doing their part of the job. Make sense? Because if you take on the task at hand, you're going to be labeled as the loan officer who just does it all. And who's not going to leverage that? What process do you know? Like, ooh, I, man, I got Daniel. Daniel does everything. I love Daniel's files. Yeah, they love your files because you're doing all the work for them. But you're never going to be able to reach your potential if you're doing, if you're wearing too many hats, right? And so if you're doing sales and you're doing the processing and you're doing the, the um, you know, the step retrieval or you're gathering the conditions to get yourself to docs, you're doing too much, Every successful organization worth working for has an engine. It has a system. All you need to do is understand how that system works. The bare bones of how it works is it actually works just like sales. So a salesman is on a sales team. That sales team is, is led by a sales team manager or a sales team lead, right? That sales manager reports to a higher uh, uh, authority, which typically is either an area manager, regional manager, or a VP. Make sense? There's that hierarchy. And so if, if, if operations follows that exact same hierarchy, so every loan processor is part of a team, every, every team is being led by a team lead, every team lead reports to a VP or a regional, something within that operations field, all we need to do is understand the hierarchy. And so if one loan processor is inefficient, I'm going to ensure that my communications are also carbon copy or CC to the team lead. And I'm doing it in a professional way, guys. I'm not doing it in a way where I'm trying to, you know, what I mean, run like run them over with a with a bus. I'm not trying to, you know, downplay their characteristics. I'm not defaming them. What I'm doing is just professionally, in so many words, illustrating how how um, the processor is not doing the processor side of the job. Because you, if you don't understand how to work that system, you're going to find yourself taking too much on and then growing resentment for, to your employer when it's not even really your employer. It's not even your leads. It's, it's, not, it's not the company. It's just that one fucking processor. And so I get it, you know, man. If there's anything I get, I get that part because when we hand the baton off to our operations, we, we expect them to deliver. We look at it as like, hey, man, you wouldn't have your job as a loan processor if, if, if you didn't have me as sales because what the hell are you going to process? You're going to go out here and sell Mr. Patel, right? Like you, you, that, this is how we think. And so I get it. But at the same time, if you're, if you're not going to take the right actions to change that care, that, that attitude or change that, um, that work ethic, right? From that particular process, you're going to find yourself, uh, feeling like you need to do it with every process. You're going to take it out on the processes that are efficient. So for the love of God, please stop processing your files and stop doing the admin tasks that are burning up your time. You could delegate that. You just need to know who to delegate it to. And if you, dele if you are delegating it to someone who is non-responsive, they they, they're not doing what they need to do. You need to put them on blast, but in a professional way through their um, sales or their, their actual team lead, right? And after so many times where the, the concern comes up so often, they're either going to stop putting you together or they're going to coach the loan processor or, or, or get them out, get them out of the company, right? Because they're actually doing more harm than, than, uh, than good. And I think either way you win, right? So think about that. And then um, another thing is, is because we feel that we need to do processing and admin work, what usually happens is you get addicted to babysitting your pipeline. So let me give you an example. So Every single day, you're doing more pipeline management over the deals that you already have in your pipeline, and you're doing every single step to get it that much closer to, to close. And sometimes this means that you're stalking your processor or you're, you're doing too much, like you're pulling up your underwriting steps, right? You're looking at your PTDs, you're, you're shooting emails out to the appraisal management company to get an ETA. Let all that happen. Like avoid babysitting your pipeline. The top producers that I know, that even, even, even a practice that I do is I don't count 
my files in my pipeline. Like I don't really pay attention to that because what I understand is that before it gets to my pipeline, it needs to go to, it needs to go through me, right? And we have a queue. So it gets filtered before it goes into processing and it's filtered through a department of production assistance. So the production assistants basically make sure the title's in, appraisal's ordered, it makes sure everything is buttoned up before it goes into the processing queue. Right. So my job as a salesman is to continuously feed that queue. And I don't care how many is in the queue month to date. I don't care how many is in the queue week to date. All I care is, is how am I going to find two to put inside that queue? Because I need to feed that queue consistently. And if you make a, a, a quick switch, you're not going to find yourself where you have a pipeline of 15. You're constantly looking at it. You're already counting the money. You're, you're saying, oh man, I already got 30 grand in commission. You're not going to be doing that because when you do that, you'll naturally ease off. You won't be as hungry or kind of as motivated to continue to feed it. Yeah, I know you got 15 to 20 grand coming up in the next 45 days, but what if it could be 40? Why not 50? Why not 60? So if you get caught up in the details from doing your processing and admin work, and you're constantly looking at your pipeline, you're constantly sweating, hey, how come this file hasn't moved to the, to, uh, uh, the next milestone? You're gonna miss out on the actual fundamentals of how to make uh, you know, the most money you can as a salesman, and it's just constant feeding uh, to the machine. It's constant feeding to the pipeline. And you have to grow the, the trust inside your process. I mean, damn, you're working there, right? So if you don't trust the process, you're going to have a hard time working there because, you know, all day you're involved in that process. And if you grow resentment with the process and there's negative influence around you who also agree that the process is kind of flawed, you're in a bad state of mind. And unfortunately, that's going to cost, cost you a lot of money instead of looking at ways that you can adapt like you know, making mention to the loan processor to in front of their team lead of saying, hey, looks like we're, we're going through this issue again. I have a phone call with the Joneses at 4 p.m. Since I didn't hear from you, please look at, you know, the snapshot or the snip of the con log. There's no notes. Please see the attached email that I didn't get a response for over the last three days. All I'm doing is, is seeing if I can help. Since I have a call with them at four o'clock, is there any way that you can help me, Jim? And let's say Jim is like the team lead. Right, so now you're exposing their inefficiencies, and either one or two things are going to happen. Number one, they're going to stop putting you guys together, and number two, the loan process is going to get coached or booted out. And again, it's a win-win, right? Because you need all your cylinders firing. You need to leverage the system in place and trust that process so that you can focus on what you're good at, and it's originating sales to feed to that processing queue. Is that making sense, guys? Now, I'll, let's see who will admit. Who admits right now, who's watching this right now, who's, who's willing to admit that you babysit your pipeline? Man, are you stocking that processor, bro? Like the very first thing you do, like some companies, like my organization has a uh, time limit. Uh, so we can't bother operations until 1201, right? We have uh, what's called quiet time for operations. And what the funny thing is, though, some of us will kind of be defeated, like, oh, man, I can't reach out to them until 12. And so then they plan their whole day around 12. You know what I do? What I do is I prepare an email, a follow up email on that file. I do everything that I need to do. So if I'm if I'm an inefficient, if I'm working with an inefficient processor and I already know because I've I've worked with them before. And instead of hate the system or hate life or hate my employer, what I do is I just simply adapt and I create a solution for it. So if I'm getting connected to Jennifer, Jennifer fucking you know what I mean? Like, ugh, makes you really frustrated because they don't have the work ethic like you. She's not on top of her game. It takes her damn near nine months to make an intro call to the to the prospect. And we're like, damn, I got Jennifer, right? So I already know because I've taken the steps to put Jennifer in the light with her team lead and say, hey, you know, uh, it looks like we're going through it again. You know, the example that I just gave you, but I'm, I'm more premeditated. So if I couldn't reach out to Jennifer until 1201, I could still handle my admin tasks or my follow-ups in the morning, but then I could change my outlook to where the message isn't sent out from my outbox until 1201. And so I'm already achieving it, which gives me these little small wins, which grows my confidence and, eight, and enables me to be the absolute best that I can be. Does that make sense? So I know it's already handled. I can get it off my plate. The weight's not on my shoulders. I'm not constantly thinking, will Jennifer get that email? Or I gotta you know, email Jennifer or give her a call at 12 o'clock. You already have it in the queue and it's already set up. And it's, when, when you release that weight off of you, you feel much more revived. You feel better, right? So again, keep that in mind because if you find yourself doing a lot of the admin and the processing tasks, you're burning up your time. And then uh, uh, finally, 
the idea of being proactive versus reactive. In this example that I just shared with you about Jennifer, you know, we all have the Jennifer at our company, right? We all have that one processor, right? When we see it, the, our files assigned to them, we kind of get that, that feeling in our gut, like, damn it, that one's not going through, or damn it, that, that's, that's gonna require a lot of my work. And, and, and when that happens, if you're reactive to it, you're not proactive to it. And so being proactive, meaning once I see that this file is actually assigned to Jennifer, I'm gonna be proactive and set up the expectations with that prospect to, to be comfortable with the way Jennifer works. So I'm not gonna tell the prospect, hey, Jennifer's gonna be in contact with you every day, right? Jennifer is so easy to get a hold of, or Jennifer's gonna make a, an introduction to you in about a week. Because what happens if I say those statements, then I'm under pressure if Jennifer performs or not. Then I need to find, I need to explain to you know, my prospect why Jennifer is not doing what I told them. Instead, I'm gonna be proactive so I don't find myself being reactive. And I'm gonna say, hey Jim, right, that's the prospect. Hey Jim, we just got uh, assigned our processor. Jennifer's great. She's actually, you know, she, she just, she's a workhorse. As a matter of fact, the only time she ever reaches out to you is if she needs anything. So no news is good news. I would imagine that we should have an update in the next two to three weeks. I'll keep you posted. Meanwhile, I'm always available by text, email, or phone call. So feel free to reach out to me if there are any questions. If Jennifer doesn't reply back to you, don't worry, just contact me, right? And so now that I've set up the expectation, I'm not worried that Jim is gonna be kind of neglected by Jennifer because Jim's already made aware of how the process works and I didn't set up Jim with the understanding that Jennifer is gonna be in constant contact because I already know that Jennifer doesn't operate that way. Does that make sense? So now a lot of pressure is taken off my shoulders from being uh, anxious of whether or not Jim likes Jennifer no one likes Jennifer. <laughs> so I hope that makes sense, man. But you know, you, you just got to be proactive. So if you, if you pay attention to the things that you're more reactive uh, uh, to, like during the day, if you're more reactive to objections, then you just need to be proactive and understand what objections you, you always get. And then be proactive to craft your message in a way that addresses those objectives before it happens. Very powerful stuff, right? And again, these are habits and these are hacks that I'm noticing from uh, all the top producers. It, it's basically their, it's the actions that they take. It's, it's a matter of becoming so efficient at their job that they don't look at doing things over and over and over again. They just want to do it right so that it can, it can free up more time so that they can do other things that contribute towards their success. And that's really the power of being proactive versus reactive. And so I'd like to know what your thoughts are though. You know, like comment in the comment box. Let me know if this is powerful stuff. If, if, if already it's giving you some ideas that you can implement today to actually increase your revenue, increase your production, because things like that are what sets apart the top producers from the mediocre. And the funny thing is, is that the mediocre always had an option to simply mirror and model the top producers. And so that, that was my secret hack. Like I, I didn't want to be mediocre. I didn't want to be the dude that was worried about whether or not they're going to hit quota. I didn't want to be the dude that was super excited just because he hit fucking mediocre results. I wasn't that dude. What I wanted to figure out was, hey, how come this dude or this chick is getting the most money? How is she making more sales? I want to figure out what their hack is. I'm going to tweak it, make it mine, and I'm going I'm to do it better. I'm going to outshine you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I'm outshine you, bro. So that was always kind of the way I looked at it. And I think that if we can adopt this kind of same mindset and look at how you spend your time each day and figure out what areas are inefficient, and maybe it's some of the things that I've just shared with you right now inside of this live stream. Maybe you're doing some of the actions that now opens your eyes to, oh, so that's why I keep getting hit with the objection if I wanna think about it. Or, oh, that's why I'm not converting as many leads into sales is because I'm just pitching at random times. Or, oh, that's why they're not giving me any callbacks is because I'm not sending them a text along with an email. Oh, that's why they don't read my emails because I say, hi, Jim, versus, hey, Jim, check this out, right? Like it was meant to be. It's little switches like that your internal dialogue. Like I want you to play with that. I want you to understand how powerful it is because auto-suggestion is the very first thing that your brain hears. And, and when, you, when you react to certain things, your instinct 
is telling you exactly where you're at. And so if you look at your objective and you say, I hope I get everything done today, you've already set up your day to just be all about hopes. Now, <laughs> you're right, you just, you just, your whole day is gonna be cross fingers and hopes, bruh. That's gonna be a hard way to live, man. So you need to, you need to understand how, you, you, how your in, internal dialogue sounds. And when you make the small adjustments from, you know, something as small as from high to hay, or from uh, will to need, right? It's these little little changes that mount up all of this progress and these little wins. And you're understanding how to kind of biohack your own mindset so that you are operating in a different way. You're operating in a different you know, magnitude of energy. Like everything is coming out just confidence is because that's how you become a top producer. That's how you surpass top production. So I really hope you guys take away some of the information that I've shared with you. Do me a favor. I see a lot of you guys on here. Hit that thumbs up button. There's some real valuable stuff on, on, on this uh, live stream. And the thumbs up is just a sign that you guys are really absorbing this message. So do me a favor. Hit the thumbs up. You know, if you're in the car, be sure you hit the thumbs up later. And, uh, and, and I, again, I appreciate your support. I did make mention that I will be doing some, some Q&A at the end of this. So let me see in the comments section if anybody uh, left any questions. Marina, what up? Corona in the house. Mo, what up, lady? Kevin Scott, appreciate you from joining us from Chi-Town. Felicia, many feet, California. Welcome. Um, let's see, Fazia. Good morning, New York in the house. Adam, thank you for all the support, Adam. Uh, let me see, from Chicago. If any of you guys have any questions that you would like me to answer, you know, about the content here, just some any random content, I got about 10 minutes that we could put towards Q&A. Hey D, dropping gems as always. Appreciate that, Adam. Steffi, Stephanie, another one from Chi-Town. What up, lady? Pat. <laughs> guilty hey man at least you got courage to admit it right not too many people would admit it but admit admitting it is is literally the first step to making progress so i salute you pat art i work for a brokerage i do have a processor but i don't have an assistant should i hire an assistant art i think that you should hire an assistant if your production calls for one right um, because if you're just hiring all kinds of roles and, 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 and you're finding out that you could do it yourself or you're not at that production level, then save your money. You don't need an assistant yet. But if you find that you could be doing much more business, but you're caught up with these admin tasks, try to leverage assistance from the processor to kind of carry that weight. But if, if business is so strong and you still like your your processor is being overloaded to where she can't do her job, you're being overloaded to where you can't bring a new business, then yeah, it's time to hire. It's time to hire an assistant. So really put some thought to that. Um, Scott Short, Sacktown in the house. Boo boo. What up, Scott? Martin Capital. Nobody likes Jennifer. They don't, bro. Jennifer boo boo is fuck. Like no one likes Jennifer and we each have a Jennifer right in our operations. Well, at least now you know how to handle Jennifer so that Jennifer is not messing with your paper. And that's the last thing we want to do because next time we see Jennifer at, at the fucking break room, we might just kick her in the shin real quick. I'm just kidding. Please don't kick your Jennifer in the shin. Please be nice. The, the key thing is that you just need to be cordial. You need to do it in a professional way where it's not looking like, like you're being a douche right like you like some los like we get we get heated up we get passionate and so we'll end up just you know doing it all in caps with like nine question marks and three exclamation points and under <laughs> underline and, and and we're so mad we can't we're not even spelling the words right and we're we're just like clicking away like the spell check doesn't even correct the word so it just comes out like this blodged mess <laughs> it's just emotion right uh but just like what we do with our prospects is if you feel any anger if you feel any uh kind of vengeance at the time that you're creating a message my best advice to you is don't send it just type it up though fill that bitch out right go ahead and let it all out let it all out until you feel good but don't send it i want you to revisit it in about 10 15 minutes or maybe an hour and then look at it 
Because what will happen is at that time that you revisit it, you're not going to feel as passionate. You're actually going to be a little bit more collected. And then you can revise it and rephrase your statement in a way where you still come off professional and you still come off as the consultant. So you don't want to ruin your reputation by just simply blasting somebody. So do it in a professional way and you'll get through to her. All right. So without further ado, I think that's all. No one's actually typing up any Q, any questions to answer. So I can only imagine that I was able to answer your questions within this live stream. Uh, join me tomorrow. Tomorrow's FIF. For those of you who don't know what FIF is, look it up. Hashtag FIF every Friday, usually between the hours of 6, 6.30. Haven't came down with the time, um, but I'm going to be, you know, helping all of us in the sales world vent. And we're going to be venting on uh, certain topics and certain things that that we need to understand how to overcome because those are the things, again, that we're venting on, right? We vent on things that cause us pain. We vent on things that cause us frustration. We vent on things that cause us resentment. And so every Friday, I got FIF where we take a topic that we're all venting, we're all frustrated with, and then we address it. And I think that that theme or that episode is really going to help a lot of people kind of break past the grind and also give you an opportunity to really understand that you're not in it alone. You're not going through the grind alone. You go through the grind at all levels. But the key thing is, though, can you figure out a way to overcome that grind? Can you figure out a way to overcome that challenge? And if you can, well, guess what? You get to level up and you'll know exactly how to address it if it ever comes up again. And so FIF is very powerful. So I really do hope that you guys um, join me again tomorrow. It'll, it'll uh, be live. Joseph Medina, you speak knowledge, my friend. Thank you. And God bless you for providing this very useful information. I appreciate you, Joseph. Hope all is well, man. Jay, thanks for the uh, thumbs up. I appreciate you guys. So uh, without further ado, I think this is the end of the session. Have an amazing day. Uh, if you ever have any questions, you can always email me. My, you can email my team. Uh, we'll be more than happy to provide you any solutions. And keep an eye out because on 420, it's going to mark the one year anniversary since launching um, Sales Remastered University. So I got some special announcements. The only way that you're going to get those announcements is if you if you've requested and opted in for a copy of my free sales script, if you don't have a copy of that sales script, be sure you get a copy of it. Learn how to integrate it in with your communication and you'll have a far easier time um, uh, generating new sales. So be sure you request a copy of that. If you do, you're going to get emails from me uh, giving you valuable content all throughout the week, but also important reminders and notices of certain specials that are going on. And there's going to be a big special this Saturday. So get ready for that. And I wish you guys an amazing day. I'll see you on the next live stream. Bye.